Digital Script by Noah Chang Lindenberg. Thesis. We are all slave to our desires, which leads to thinking and acting against our own interests. People in Florence gather and party, despite protocol as the plague ravages the city. The Dance of Death by Michael Walgnut, 1493. The inescapable presence of death became a motif during the Black Plague. The Dance of Death shows the universality of death. No matter your class, you are equal at death. In the Decameron, many people in Florence did not stay home and instead partied and literally danced till death. Without the material or emotional means of coping with the pandemic, the Black Plague ran its course, killing about half of the population in Italy. Today, the desire for social interaction incapacitates our ability to socially distance during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 14th century Florence, the city was not sophisticated enough to deal with the Black Plague. As the city breaks down, so do the people's psychic, so they party. Today, we have the science and social integrity to deal with the pandemic. However, this all goes to waste if we cannot handle isolation from our friends and loved ones. Today, COVID-19 deaths in America are upwards of 250,000 deaths caused by our inattention to safety protocol. The love of our friends and family may actually harm them. Because citizens want to be free from government restraints, this prolongs our state of quarantine. During the 2020 election, many residents in red states have been disregarding safety protocols as encouraged by President Donald Trump. This desire to be free from government restraint has been detrimental to our nation's health and might lead to a more heavily enforced quarantine. Our desire for freedom from the elite, such as government and health experts, has caused us to have less and less freedom. As seen in Figure 1, blue states, which are often much more highly populated because they are in cities, had more cases and deaths from COVID-19 at the beginning. But at the end of September, red states has surpassed blue states in cases of COVID-19 deaths, although having less population. In his attempt to protect the economy, President Trump has led his supporters to disregard safety precautions set by lead health experts, effectively killing hundreds of thousands of Americans and disrupting the socio-economic climate enough to lose a second term. He, too, acted against his own interest. Our impulsive feelings are detrimental to our ability to think critically. Oftentimes, we believe only what we want to believe. In Plato's allegory of the cave, the prisoners can only see the shadows that the puppeteers cast on the wall in front of them. So when they face reality, they may not know what to believe. They often will reject reality. This rejection of reality is seen today by much of the Republican base. When Fox News reported that Donald Trump had lost the 2020 election, the network lost viewers to Newsmax and OAN. These channels continue to push false realities that reconfirm their viewers' false beliefs. This confirmation bias inhibits our ability to think critically. Some hold belief higher than evidence. And this becomes dangerous. If we become slave to our desires, we might risk narrow-mindedness. In Unflattening by Nick Susanis, we see that humans are given depth in our sight and many senses to understand our surroundings. Susanis wants to counteract the narrow-mindedness of flatness that humans are bound to. He feels that we are conditioned to be flat. Instead, we should use our vantage points to see past the boundaries of our current flat state of mind. Unflattening teaches us, at least encourages us, to access understanding that we could not have before. A quote from Unflattening reads, Concrete experiences serve as the primary building blocks from which we extend our capacity for thought and give rise to more abstracted concepts. We understand the new in terms of the known. Many of these concrete experiences come from our parents. We grow with a mixture of nature and nurture. We must not become narrow-minded because of these concrete experiences. By nature, we have a brain that is capable of critical thinking past our previous biases and desires. It is true that we understand the new in terms of the known. Looking past what we already know is a healthy form of curiosity, and it will keep us from only acting on our first instincts. In Plato's Allegory of the Cave, the puppeteers feed into our desire for understanding. This desire for understanding and control leads us to peril. As seen in Unflattening, prior knowledge shapes our ideas. Our concrete experiences serve as the primary building blocks for our understanding of the world. These experiences become beliefs, and we often hold these beliefs above all else above evidence of or our best interest. This is a sort of confirmation bias as well. When we hear what we want to hear so we can feel a sense of understanding of the world, to feel as though we are right. This is why so many people turn to religion. One reason is because they were raised that way. But another reason that religion, especially Christianity in America, has mass appeal is because it provides an understanding of the world that we humans cannot yet understand. 
It solves many of the unknowns that humans struggle with, and people feel comfortable with their perceived knowledge of our existence and purpose. I warn religious people to be careful in how they practice their religion. Judeo-Christian values, for example, are very good and meaningful values. We can uphold these values without completely disregarding scientific and human reason. If God created us, he also created our brains that are capable of critical thinking. We should use this capacity to do great things in the world and not be limited by our narrow-mindedness. As it turns out, the desire for money and wealth is one of the strongest desires of mankind. In Book 8 of Plato's Republic, Plato describes our insatiable desire for wealth and how it hinders our society. People are driven into poverty. The poor become poorer and the rich become richer. There is no order or harmony. In such a disorderly society, we may seek safety in a ruler. Instead of a wise ruler, someone that will protect us from all evil. This simple-minded ruler came to be in 2016. The president fed in our worst instincts, fear and otherism. He capitalized on our hatred. Some thought that he would bring the nation together and make America great again. However, he took advantage of his supporters. He has continued to cut taxes for the rich and pardon the most evil of people. He shows just how powerful our desires are. We are so scared of the unknown. We are so scared of others that we give up our ideas to one person that cares about nothing but himself. The donated money for his fraud campaign has gone almost completely to the RNC and to his debt, not to the cause that he said it was for. So we see that money and wealth is the ideal of power in American culture. However, many other cultures believe in a balance. Plato states that the four unjust constitutions of city and man are presented as inevitable stages of degeneration. Victory, honor, and money will always be predominant. Capitalism thrives on human nature. Politicians thrive on people's worst instincts. Why are we so willing to give up our freedom of thought to follow a leader? We end up supporting ideas that contradict our best interest and our morals. However, that depends on what we feel our best interest is. Why choose good is an ongoing human dilemma. What does it afford us? If our worst instincts and desires afford us much more, shouldn't we follow those desires? I believe not. I believe our moral standards and standards of justice hold us above these evil desires, as we have read so much about in our class, Imagining Justice. We listen to our worst desires because the primitive parts of our brain are so overwhelming in our thought. So why should we choose good? Why not listen to our desires? This is a big question to deal with. In reading passages from Nicomachean Ethics, one finds that there are ways to see just from unjust. It is not impossible. We know that a lot of it has to do with our motive for our actions. If an unjust act is purposeful or not, that can make a big difference in how we perceive someone's character and how they should be persecuted under the law. It seems that we know what is right and what is wrong, but it can be hard to make the distinction in real time. Our desires are powerful and can lead us in the wrong direction. We should be mindful when we can. We must notice our desires and control them, however, oftentimes we cannot. This struggle is ongoing. We are, quote, made in the image and likeness of God, end quote. However, we are in a constant struggle with our desires. Sigmund Freud challenged the idea that all our behaviors were conscious. He believes that the unconscious mind is part of every aspect of our lives. It influences our actions, whether we know it or not. We are constantly pulled by our desires, however, we also follow rules. Our desires are not always bad, of course. It is just that we have to control them, be conscious of them. In Plato's chariot allegory, mortals have horses of opposing desires. If one cannot control them, they will fall in accordance to how truthful they have been. We live our lives having to balance our desires to attain happiness and our highest goals. If we cannot, one can see how devastating this can be to ourselves and the people we love. As Tony Schwartz of Harvard Business Review said, We need to learn to better regulate our emotions, which begins with gaining more control of our attention. That's the next evolutionary leap and is on the horizon. Thank you for listening.